Um, thank you, Madeline, for the introduction, and uh, thank you to uh, the Veterinary Vaccinology Network and Safia and um, Paragon for inviting me to speak. I have to say, I'm not the first choice speaker on this subject or the second choice. Um, <laughs> uh, two weeks ago, I was asked to um, to stand in for my uh, for our uh, di re uh, research director or chief scientific oper uh, operating officer of um, Galvmed to do this talk. Um, so I, uh, I'm going to, there, were, there are areas of the talks I was listening to yesterday where I, I'll try and um, uh, remember to, to sort of uh, go into uh, because they do uh, uh, come in at, in various points in my talk. Um, I confess also that I'm not um, an expert in One Health. <laughs> there will be people here who are more expert in One Health than I and better able to speak, but hopefully that will lead to uh, interesting discussions at, at the end of my talk. Um, but I really want to highlight some of the areas where Galvmed have been working, um, and also I will sort of mention one or two other areas which I think are relevant, examples where I think are relevant to veterinary vaccines in the One Health perspective. So I thought I'd better do an introduction um, to Galvmed. Um, uh, we're basically an, an international uh, not-for-profit organisation based in Edinburgh um, and established since 2008 with funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and DFID. So we have regional offices in Delhi, uh, India and Nairobi in Kenya, where I'm based, um, and staffing of roughly about 30 people. We have no laboratories, no manufacturing facilities or licenses. Uh, and the way we work uh, is through partnership with organisations, uh, manufacturers, academia, in, um, public sector, um, and also the expensive use of external consultants. Um, perhaps we can be best described as a product development partnership. Um, so a little bit of the two, main two areas of wh where we work. Um, in product development, which is where I'm involved, uh, mainly with uh, developing new or improved uh, products. Um, these can be either vaccines, and mostly they're vaccines, um, therapeutics um, or diagnostics. Um, uh, where there's a need to, to where we, there's a, and, and identifying specific needs um, of smallholder farmers in developing countries, specifically Africa and South Asia. Um, the market development side, which is now morphed into a commercial department, um, but this really is to um, is is using the inherent commercial value of, of of these products that are come sometimes come out of product development department, but sometimes come from from other sources, um, and make them widely available to smallholder farmers. Um, and the two two key de key areas of uh, work are underpinned by a broad range of support functions such as project management, policy support, um, monitoring and evaluation. So Galsmed's vision is to see uh, livestock vaccines and medicines in wide state, wide, widespread sustainable use by smallholders. Just a, a little snapshot really of our portfolio, we basically work on 13 key diseases and um, so it's really just to illustrate the different stages that we're at uh, in terms of what ones are in progress, which ones are commercial um, and we basically follow the um, product development uh, cycle that uh, Andy mentioned uh, yesterday uh, with a view to registering these projects and making them available in, in developing countries. So. Um, so moving forward, we, because we've just finished our current funding area where most of these projects have been developed over the last 10 years, um, we, moving forward, we'll be looking more to focus on systemic products um, and reproductive products as multivalent vaccines that cover a range of serious diseases in uh, the same species, cattle, uh, poultry, sheep, uh, sheep and goats, particul particularly. Um, so, so these, the, these, many of these diseases, such as systemic or reproductive, have similar symptoms and conditions which the smallholder farmer will not necessarily be able to differentiate. Um, but it also means that they're getting coverage for more diseases from one single administration of, of vaccine. 
So moving on to the, uh, to the One Health perspective, um, recognising that um, the health of humans, animals and uh, the environment are inextricably linked and this is what is uh, the central um, driving One Health um, in initiatives. And also that six out of ten, um, and I think it actually is, I've seen reviews where they, it's actually higher than this as well, but six out of ten or seven out of ten in infectious human diseases are spread from animals um, to people. Um, and perhaps more worrying, worryingly, three out of four newly emerging diseases are, um, uh, are also originate from animals. Um, for example, avian influenza A, H7N9. Um, so, so One Health is a, a collaborative approach that connects health experts with, from human, animal and environmental health disciplines um, at the local, national and regional and global levels. So it's a big, a big fish. Um, just thought I would just mention a few examples and I've chosen only two. Um, obviously there are many zoonotic diseases which One Health is primarily aimed at, um, but not exclusively for um, zoonotic diseases. Um, I did see a presentation on uh, One Health um, using cancer as, a, as a, an example. So, um, but I'm going to focus just on um, these two examples. Um, so Rift Valley Fever, I've chosen these two examples because um, one is, this one is more of an epidemic type, uh, outbreak type uh, disease and the other uh, rabies uh, is more of an endemic situation and obviously involving slightly different control strategies although using a One Health approach. So, so Rift Valley Fever, as many will know, is caused by a virus that's transmitted by mosquitoes and has caused many uh, multiple outbreaks in Africa and the Middle East um, and the virus can cause severe disease in both people and animals. So by preventing Rift Valley fever by vaccinating animals, fewer people will be infected from mosquitoes, um, so the burden of mosquitoes will be less, and then obviously, or from direct contact with, um, with sick animals. So vaccination also protects the, the animals from the, that the people rely on for food uh, and as a source of income. So One Health has been, approach has been followed in an epidemiological study. I'm just using one example here specifically. Um, and this paper that's just recently been published, and this has been uh, a project funded by, uh, been run by Eco Health Alliance, and um, it's, they're following a One Health approach to do an epi epidemiological study on Rift Valley fever in South Africa, um, and the benefits that materialise in higher statistical power by um, having teams of from the human health um, entomological teams, uh, animal health teams. Um, to do all the sampling uh, and, and mapping um, and this gives far greater statistical, statistical power uh, and, um, and the, the reports in 35% uh, cost savings by having these um, collaborative teams that are aligned in terms of their operational when they go out sampling and so on. Um, and also just on Rift Valley Fever, only last week um, and as an example of, of, of One Health and a joined up approach the, uh, a joint statement issued by the Kenyan Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Agriculture of a potential risk of a Rift Valley fever outbreak due to the higher than, than um, <coughs> normal uh, rainfall that they're experiencing there, that we're experiencing there at the moment. Um, so there's just um, processes that have been put in place um, that uh, uh, using models for predicting outbreaks. Um, I think the last outbreak in Kenya was 2007, 2008. Um, but the last El Nino conditions and um, so they're predicting there's a higher risk of Rift Valley fever outbreaks um, and then that will set off a, mo uh, 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 a cascade of um, processes that will be followed um, and, and involving a, a vaccination of, uh, of, the, uh, of livestock and so on. Moving on to rabies, um, it's another One Health challenge. Uh, nearly all human rabies fatalities are due to the bite from a rabid uh, dog. Um, efficacious dog vaccines are available um, and awareness and access to post-exposure prophylaxis is very, very variable and these are the challenges that there are. And there is a perception that control is not cost effective. However, modelling studies have demonstrated that even vaccinating less than 15% of dogs can significantly reduce fatalities by 17 to 90% uh, in a, a cost-effective way. 
uh, and that's been published by Fitzpatrick et al. a couple of years ago. Um, now, what are the the the, um, the slide I've, the the figure I've put up here is from the uh, Global Alliance for Rabies Control, um, which was uh, set up and by the FAO and the WHO, um, and they have come up with a um, a, a stage uh, stage of a stepwise approach to rabies control, um, and this is really the various stages which are carefully um, measured uh, and you don't go from one stage to another without fulfilling the, uh, uh, the defined um, objectives. Um, so, and there's, there's, there's uh, very useful documents on the website. Um, to the, so it's a very, I would say formalized, but not, not prescriptive, but formalized uh, uh, blueprint to, um, to, uh, to how to, get, to end up from where you have stage naught, where there's very little information on rabies, um, but it's suspected to be present, to ending up at stage five, where you've got a country free of, um, not sure which one of these is the, that's that one, a country free of uh, dog transmitted rabies. Uh, at a recent, uh, just gonna sort of link into cystin cystisicosis now, which is my um, pet project. Uh, at a recent Cystinet meeting in Paris, it was proposed that uh, the blueprint for rabies would be um, would be a good uh, template for implementation of um, uh, national teniasis cystisicosis control. So the project will provide a, an initial evaluation for the for the project that Galvmed have undertaken is to provide evidence uh, and an initial evaluation of different um, strategies. Um, and to develop a roadmap for teniasis and cystisicosis controlled in uh, control in selected countries. So moving on to cystisicosis, um, and this sort of uh, I'm linking into Damer's presentation on parasite vaccines yesterday, and he mentioned the um, the cystisvax uh, vaccine. Um, cystisicosis is a, is a serious public health issue. Um, it is a I call it a a neglected, a neglected, neglected tropical disease um, because it seems to fall down even below the radar of, of other, uh, other neglected tropical diseases. So um, it's a fairly, in a way, a simple life cycle um, with, the, uh, with the, the definitive host in man uh, having tapeworm, shedding tapeworm in the faeces and the only intermediate host is the pig, the domestic pig, um, and uh, they ingest the eggs and uh, they develop into cysts in the muscles, um, and people eat poorly cooked or uncooked uh, meat, and the cycle continues. Um, people can also uh, develop the cystic form of, uh, of the cystisicosis by uh, eating contaminated um, food, uh, contaminated with eggs, uh, and they develop cysts, uh, well, uh, skin nodules, or more seriously, develop cysts in the brain, um, and, and, and this can cause neurocystosis, um, which is a preventable form of epilepsy. So that's the that's the <coughs> life cycle. Um, it was identified in 1993 as one of six potentially eradicable diseases. Um, so there's some very well-known diseases in this list, um, some of which are uh, eradicated or at very now very low levels. Cystisicosis still remains uh, one of those that's not re not being tackled at the moment. Um, so here's a picture of the uh, endemicity of, of T. solium, and you can see it is primarily a disease of uh, uh, of developing countries, um, South, South America, Africa, and a Asia. And um, it's primarily uh, endemic because of the back backyard pig rearing um, practices. Um, 80 to 90% of pig production um, can be, uh, is uh, backyard pig re rearing in a lot of these um, areas. Uh, and people live in close proximity with their animals, often in the same house or hut and um, sanitation is very poor and there is unregulated pig 
slaughter practices and, and, and so on. And uh, so all the risk factors are present in these countries. So at a joint um, FAO and WHO expert meeting, T. Solium was, um, was ranked uh, top of 24 foodborne parasitic diseases of global importance. Um, more so, uh, the WHO in 2012 also um, uh, issued a roadmap for implementation of control of a number of um, uh, neglected tropical diseases, and sister psychosis was on there. Um, and the roadmap was basically to, by 2015, to have a um, validated strategy for control and elimination of T. solium, and then by 2020 to have inter interventions scaled up in selected countries for T. solium, teniasis, and sister psychosis control. And that's, we're kind, we are moving uh, along that roadmap reasonably uh, uh, nicely, as one can, apart from some of the challenges that, that uh, beset us. So uh, another sort of stat that's came out from the uh, Foodborne Disease Burden Epidemiology Reference Group um, from WHO and FAO as well, that Tinea solium is, ranks fourth in terms of the economic burden, um, only behind um, Salmonella and, and, and Enteropathic E. coli um, in terms of dailies. Uh, um, it's not so high on the deaths per year, but that's still quite a lot. Uh, or the morbidity as well is, is not so high, but the, the consequences of, of epilepsy, and this, the costings are mainly best based on epilepsy. Um, uh, the burden um, in term, on people is, in terms of this disability is really very, very high. So, um, so it, is a, it is an important um, disease. The impact of, of epilepsy, 6 to 5 million people in the world, uh, probably a bit more near 70, um, have e epilepsy uh, and more than 80% of epilepsy, people with epilepsy live in developing countries. So there's a high um, preponderance of people with epilepsy in, in, in developing countries and a third of them have been shown to, a um, third of epilepsy cases are estimated to be due to neurocystis psychosis, which is a preventable form of epilepsy. So the annual proportions of deaths can some vary between um, somewhere like Cameroon, where it's 6.9%, to Mexico um, of 0.5%. Uh, so the symptoms of NCC cause two-thirds of wage earners to lose their jobs. So there is significant economic impact on, on people uh, in terms of people that are affected by neurocystis psychosis. Um, uh, and these were studies um, that have been uh, reported in the WHO uh, publication on neglected tropical diseases. Um, so the also that comes with this and in terms of the social aspects of the stigmatization um, and the incapacitation, um, as I've mentioned already. <coughs> so controlling the disease, um, obviously with a relatively simple life cycle and um, relatively few hosts. Um, there are possibilities of uh, controlling the disease by um, in the people by treating them with um, things like praziquantel or niclozamide, mass drug administration in the, in the community. Um, there are also uh, ways, in improvements by correct cooking and meat inspection and also in terms of sanitation and pig husbandry. So these are, are coming across both human um, public health and, um, uh, and also animal health sort of aspects of control. Um, various of these um, strategies have been used in control um, and with, with, some t with variable success um, uh, and, and reinfection generally, and I, I sort of, gen I do, apologise for generalising greatly, but reinfection um, very often occurs um, after um, implementation of such control strategies. Um, the availability more recently of um, <coughs> tools to um, in the pig have, uh, have uh, led us to, um, well, this is where Galsmed is, 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 is in, involved, and uh, so developing good uh, controls in the pig. Uh, and ultimately control will be uh, important to, to use all of those aspects of control, trust strategies uh, as a one health approach. 
So uh, the international, the, the trials that have been done, I just want to talk a little bit about the vaccine. The, there were, there's been a number of uh, tr control trials across um, uh, South America, Africa and um, China. Um, so uh, these have been published uh, and you'll see the very high level of protection um, that's been afforded. Um, I should say a little bit, and I will say a little bit more, uh, a bit more detail about the vaccine. Um, and then more recently, uh, large field trials in Peru, uh, mainly funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, have been completed um, in 105 villages, um, 80,000 people, uh, 55,000 pigs, um, and uh, they basically um, showed that the One Health approach, uh, a very complex and intensive uh, control strategy, um, showed that the transmission of uh, T. solium infection was interrupted at the, on a regional scale in a highly endemic region in Peru. Um, so our PC program overview is to um, support the, the development uh, and registration of a vaccine, uh, T. sol 18, Cisfax that um, Dama mentioned yesterday, and um, ox, uh, used, used with oxfendazole um, and, uh, and ensure availability <coughs> in developing countries. Um, the gaps that were needed to be filled to demonstrate uh, that this, an effective uh, d disease control strategy that would be appropriate for uh, regional settings in developing countries. Um, and to generate a data package um, that uh, would attract a human <coughs> health partner to drive the a forward uh, phase two program, a large, larger scale up uh, uh, and um, integrated approach to controlling cystotenous sodium infection. So the key activities are, have been on registration um, and uh, we've worked through partnership, as I mentioned before, as that's how GalvMed works, <coughs> with commercial manufacturers and um, the developers of the vaccine and then to undertake pilot trials leading to data supporting uh, the use in pigs and potential health care benefits. So CISFAX is um, uh, recombinant, it's a recombinant uh, vaccine and it uh, came about through the collaboration with the University of Melbourne, uh, Professor Mar Marshall Lighttowers and his team who developed the vaccine um, and uh, the private sector manufacturer Indian Immunologicals. And the, the experimental vaccine was, um, was originally uh, the antigen with uh, a fusion protein, uh, sub um, fusion protein, and uh, in, in E. coli, um, and adjuvanted with uh, quillé. So this is not the most, the best commercial um, uh, pro uh, formulation. So um, Galvmed identified a commercial partner. Um, who use technologies that they have in their, their, in their own um, facility where they also manufacture vaccines for, um, for pigs uh, and cattle. Um, and they have technology in, in Piscia, in, in, in yeast, um, where the protein is excreted, a yeah, secretory protein, uh, the recombinant protein. So the scaling up um, and formulation was all done by our commercial partners. Um, to improve the yield um, and the purity of, of the vaccine and to make it suitable for commercial scale um, manufacturing. So it's manufactured to GMP uh, and it resulted in 2016 in the first registered vaccine for porcine cystosarcosis in India, where the country of manufacture. And uh, currently the registrations have been extended through um, South Asia and, um, and Africa. So I thought I'd just put this up just for interest really and just for those um, scientists that are developing new vaccine, research new vaccines for, um, that they think would be useful for a commercial purpose and it's to think about having a target product profile um, and um, I think Andy touched on some of these elements that there in terms of um, this SPC um, and these are sort of things that would go on the SPC so um, so I, what here here is it's always an idea if you're designing a vaccine to have an idea of what the target product profile is 
um, and that and then I think we talked in the discussions briefly about who should you speak to and obviously marketing companies uh, as pro um, multinationals will speak to their marketing departments and ask them what vaccine they need for, for disease what would be the best so uh, in terms of um, indications for use recommended dose um, forms routes of administration um, and so on so these are the sort of things you need to consider and um, so the, the, so there's just a few things I should just put, point out really in, in terms of I mean ideally you'd want a single dose um, vaccination with lifelong immunity um, clearly that would be the ideal situation um, Cisfax is, uh, has ticked a few of the boxes on the ideal um, um, the ideal box and I'll just go through some of the um, some of those um, some of those categories <coughs> uh, so really um, and in terms of expected efficacy um, a minimum we were looking at 80 percent protection which is a fairly um, standard sort of uh, c disease control vac vaccine efficacy one might look for but obviously in an ideal situation you'd want near a hundred percent efficacy with very little in the way of um, uh, effects on the on the on the target animal so very little in the way of injection site reactions and um, and so on so um, the field trials uh, that we undertook in four four pilot studies were undertaken uh, three pilot studies in um, South, South Africa, Sub-Saharan Sub Africa, and one in South Asia, uh, in, uh, in Nepal. And just to note that in Zambia, the, um, well, the Ugandan, Tanzania and Nepal studies were all done, uh, focused on control in pigs. And in Zambia, where we worked with academic partners, um, a One Health approach was taken with mass drug administration in people and um, vaccination and deworming in pigs and also education um, and there was even deworming in dogs as well um, but I'll talk a bit more about that so that this is just a very brief summary of the designs of our field trials they were just slightly different in um, in each of the countries <coughs> the trials were varying in length between 12 and 24 months uh, and between three and six rounds of, of intervention and primarily when I talk about intervention we were talking about um, using the vaccine and paranthic um, together um, in, in three months, uh, either every three months or every uh, four months. Um, um, and you might ask why we used um, paranthic, um, oxfendazole, but in these areas where uh, the, the disease is highly endemic um, and we had between 10 and 50% um, um, prevalence in, in, our, in our trial sites, um, many, many pigs are already infected with uh, with um, T. solium and therefore um, worming, uh, worming would be the best way to quickly get to, to treat the infection, those that are infected, and Cisfax to vaccinate those that are, um, uh, that are not infected and prevent. And then also, um, obviously, what, uh, animals that have had um, infected uh, or been treated with paranthic can be reinfected. So, um, so, the, so using the two together is, is the best bet um, in terms of controlling um, the disease in pigs. So that's, that was the basic design and also to find a, the most practical um, uh, strategy to, um, to vaccinate the pigs. Um, we're taking in mind that the, uh, the uh, cycle of the pigs, they breed all year round um, and there's a constant turnover of pigs and um, uh, so the vaccine needs to, having a having a vaccine that uh, as I mentioned the experimental vaccine was um, two vaccinations four weeks apart um, this is not really a very practical strat strategy for um, a, 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 a control um, a national control program uh, in rural communities um, so, so we looked at extending the interval between the two vaccinations um, and, um, and we found that if uh, antibody responses were actually improved in, um, uh, actually improved, were greater in, uh, in animals that have been vaccinated three or four or five months after, com even compared to animals that were vaccinated um, four weeks um, 
uh, four weeks apart. So it was a sort of an unexpected um, result. Um, I, I, that, what I didn't say in, in the earlier about CISFAX is that uh, as well as the T-SOL antigen, it was um, the the Quillet was replaced by a, a more commercial adjuvant, and it was replaced by our um, Montanide uh, 206, I think it was. Um, uh, so a, a mon um, an oil um, adjuvant, and um, and we did some comparative efficacy studies and showed that they were um, equivalent uh, in terms of their protective efficacy. So um, so anyway, on the, ba on the basis of this and with our um, more flexible uh, vaccination schedule. Um, we undertook some fi the field trials in um, in Africa and um, and South Asia. So in in Nepal, uh, we did a baseline survey. Uh, so in, in all the studies, we did a baseline survey to look at knowledge, attitudes, and practices. Um, and we saw that, um, as typical with many published um, papers on on this. Uh, many pigs um, have access to latrines, um, variable levels of actual presence of latrines. Um, in Nepal it was actually quite low, I haven't put the figure up there, but I think it was around about 70% um, um, latrine coverage. Um, and there, there have been many um, latrine building programs uh, in, in developing countries, so, so um, and one would have hoped that that would have improved um, things like um, diseases like uh, cystisicosis but but certainly um, Nepal you can see of extremely high prevalence um, nearly 30 percent um, when we did the uh, gold standard carcass dissection um, in a sample of, of, of 110 pigs so um, one of the another key factor really in terms of knowledge is that although 90 percent of of, uh, of households see cysts in their pork they don't know that it causes disease <clears throat> and in fact, in some areas, uh, not particularly in Nepal, but in some areas in Africa, um, meat with cyst is seen as um, a delicacy, uh, and they actually find it, they actually f prefer the taste of meat with cysts. Um, so it can be quite difficult to persuade them to get rid of the cysts um, if, if they don't know it causes disease. Um, so um, and we enrolled 184 households. Um, this is in um, south southern Nepal, on the border with India. Um, there were four interventions, three months apart. Uh, we got really good compliance and um, acceptance, 90% uh, or more coverage, which is really very high. In, in total, 828 pigs were, were vaccinated and dewormed. And you can see at the, uh, at the end of the, the gold standard uh, dis carcass dissection at the end of the study, um, in our control area, um, still a very high level, a bit lower, but um, a very high level of um, uh, cystisicosis in <coughs> pigs um, compared to, and there were no uh, viable or non-viable cysts in the, um, uh, the, the intervention pigs. Uh, and this was highly, this was a significant difference between, uh, between the two. So in, in Tanzania, uh, we were working in the southern highlands of Tanzania, uh, which is quite a big pig uh, rearing uh, area. Uh, there was a relatively high um, T. hydatogena, um, uh, and the reason I mention um, T. hydatogena is that there is, it cross-reacts with the uh, antigen ELISA, one of the main diagnostic tests, um, with, uh, and we did see, um, I think you'll see from the next slide uh, the, 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 what, that, what that looks like. Seroprevalence, uh, however, was 22%. Uh, um, we had a PC prevalence of porcine cystisicosis of 12%. Um, again, with the knowledge, um, the CAPS analysis, again, a high, really high level of latrines available to the households, um, and less than half of them actually accessible to the pigs. Um, but um, many of the pigs are free-ranging for much of the time, and there's still a lot of open defecation. If people, if farmers are working out in the fields, they're not going to come all the way back to, to, the, to the village to, um, to, to go to the toilet. So... Um, 51% um, of people had, again, had seen cysts, so there was quite an awareness of cysts in, in the farmers. And this has been shown by other um, researchers in the area. Um, and again, a high level of, of, of lack of awareness uh, of that it caused disease. Um, similarly, we also asked questions about um, whether people had seen tape, were aware of tapeworms in people, um, and, and there was a really uh, high level of um, lack of awareness of, of awareness in people um, of tapeworm and also that it, that it, that it caused disease. 
So, um, so um, three interventions were completed in Tanzania. Um, a, a, a lot of, lot of th over three thousand pigs vaccinated or dewormed. Just forgot to mention that in here we also had a, an arm, oxfendazole only arm, uh, which is um, we also did in Zambia. Here, so it was oxfendazole only, and it was also given every four months. Um, so, um, so at the same time as the oxfendazole and vaccination. So um, again, we got a, a high level of coverage, um, really ex excellent acceptance, um, uh, with a very very low um, incidence of adverse effects of 0.003 percent, and uh, basically one pig. And um, there was ongoing in some of the, some of the villages um, an African swine fever outbreak, and that was actually quite common across all our um, sites, uh, all our African sites, um, and obviously uh, in Zambia it had a particularly um, effect on on the num pig numbers there. But here it only affected a few villages, and then some suspicions about the that the um, the deaths were due to to drug or vaccine or ear tags. Um, so so superstitions can be quite a barrier to vaccination in in, in the villages. Um, but but in, in in Tanzania we didn't have we were managed to persuade if you, using the help of the uh, the local veterinary the DVOs the local veterinary officers um, and animal health workers um, uh, you can um, uh, explain to the farmers what's happening um, and they all know what African swine fever looks like really so um, so it's not it's, uh, it's quite different than a, a death due to a vaccine. So, um, so in the, in the end of study, um, oh, I just wanted to talk a bit about the serology. I think you can see here that um, I can't see; it's far away. Um, so, in the in the uh, T cell positive pigs, um, twenty one of them uh, were um, detected were also antigen ELISA positive, um, uh, and it ate them. So, it, it re generally associated the antigen ELISA with a um, uh, good sensitivity. Um, Good specificity. Um, however, no, sorry, other way around. Good, uh, good, reasonable sensitivity. But here, I think you can see with the T. hydatogena, it also picked up a higher proportion of T. hydatogena positive pigs than it did um, T. solium pigs, and so, uh, and then a lot of pigs that um, had neither T. solium or T. T. hydatogena that were also antigen um, positive. So uh, in this particular incidence, uh, it, it, uh, the antigen ELISA, I think, performed quite poorly. Um, so it is a challenge uh, and a gap, really, in, in terms of cystopsychosis control and monitoring the impact of intervention um, if there aren't reasonable uh, or good diagnostic um, uh, assays available. Um, so moving on to the PC prevalence, um, there uh, we had around 12% uh, at the baseline and um, at the end also a, quite a, a large reduction and we don't really know what the reason for this um, uh, oh sorry I'm, looking at, I'm meant to be looking at the controls so um, we, we didn't we didn't have a control um, group in the in the uh, in the pigs but effectively because the control animals were taken from the same areas um, village nearby villages to the um, to the intervention areas, um, the but there were pigs that weren't didn't have any intervention. Um, we we uh, decided to add this um, group to the end just to see what was going on. Um, but uh, one and and you can see that actually the oxfendazole, or it looks in terms of prevalence, it looks like the oxfendazole group didn't really have, um, and certainly they weren't significantly different. They didn't. Um, uh, it didn't have any impact. The only thing I would say is that um, th there were th we're talking about three pigs in each of these two groups, and um, in the oxfendazole group, the cysts were non-viable, uh, whereas in the uh, control group, the cysts were viable. So, but I think it, I think it does ir illustrate that um, where we've used vaccine, the vaccine has obviously been protecting um, but the pigs. I mean, I, I would think because of the low uh, prevalence and so on that the, uh, the statistics wouldn't be significant. Um, but uh, as you can see, 0.087% uh, is not significant, but almost significant. Um, so, but the uh, oxfendazole plus vaccine was significantly different from the um, 
uh, from the from the uh, baseline. So in Uganda, um, again, baseline prevalence of 15%, and um, this was carried out in eastern Uganda where there's a lot of pigs. Also in, in Uganda, it's worth mentioning that um, um, pork consumption has, has increased, and it's now one of the highest um, consumers of pork in, in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa. So, um, so the, the pig, uh, pig numbers of pigs have increased rapidly over the last uh, 15 years. Um, and uh, there's been uh, quite a lot of work done in um, in, uh, in in Uganda looking at um, epidemiology of, of uh, and the uh, uh, prevalence of cystosarcosis in um, certainly in pigs, but not so much in uh, in people. So there's a low awareness of disease uh, again um, we saw, which is obviously a key risk factor, um, and also uh, again high quite high latrine coverage again quite. A, highest levels of pigs being able to access latrines. But again, um, m m the majority of people practice uh, free-ranging pigs, um, which may be tethered for part of the day, but only one or two percent of these um, smallholder farmers um, keep their pigs intensively. So the rest are um, uh, pretty much free-ranging. Uh, six interventions were completed here. This was an extremely big uh, trial, 12,000 pigs, over 12,000 pigs vaccinated. Um, and uh, 90, 90 to 95% coverage, really excellent um, acceptability and, and compliance in the, in the area. And um, again, the pre-C prevalence was um, significantly reduced um, compared to the control area. Um, with no um, no cysts whatsoever in the uh, in the in the after car on carcass dissection, and um, uh, around 11% still in the control um, pigs. Uh, <coughs> so just a nice little picture of um, how you're handling pigs. Um, this one looks like it's standing very nicely. <coughs> uh, I think one of the things to mention in in Uganda was that. They used a central point of vaccination strategy, um, which was very efficient in terms of getting, um, the, and the farmers were very willing to bring their pigs to a central point uh, where the vaccine teams were waiting. And you just go the day before or two days before and say that you're coming and, and they have their pigs there. Ah! <laughs> Oh dear, I've been waffling. Okay, so um, good um, in Uganda, excellent f quotes from farmers uh, in terms of the benefits of the vaccination. They um, actually saw um, that the, they got less carcass condemnation um, um, and because um, the butchers would not um, uh, take pigs with cysts and wouldn't pay them. And then also a, a note from the DBO that um, pigs were cheating farmers by saying that they, they had cysts on their tongues when they didn't uh, and giving them a lower price. And by going in with the intervention, we managed to get rid of uh, that. Um, in Zambia, I'll just go through this very quickly. Um, in African swine fever ravaged our, our pig, our study pigs. So um, it was quite difficult to see what was going on. Um, and, and, and very few pigs actually had two vaccinations. Um, so um, less than uh, something like, I think, 10 or 15% of pigs actually had two vaccinations. Um, so really, um, so, uh, and uh, we also had the mass drug administration going on here. So um, uh, yes, a significant reduction um, from, um, in, in terms of cysts in the pigs. And <clears throat> as I mentioned, African swine fever have a, a ravaged the, the pig population. Um, and um, it, it's interesting to note that prevalence is very high despite high levels of use of latrines and restricted access to pigs. So again, we, um, we saw this. I just wanted to show the serology, um, just a little bit of a sort of um, correlation between uh, uh, the, the, it's not easy to see in this particular diagram which um, was given to me, but uh, the, obviously the antibody levels are higher in the, uh, antigen levels are higher in the, uh, neg in the um, intervention area than, sorry, in the, uh, in the uh, control area than the, uh, than the intervention area. Um, there's, a, there was a lot, there's a lot of socio-economic um, impacts being measured in this study um, in Zambia and they, when the baseline, they established 12% of seizures, 36% severe chronic headaches and 536 working days lost. So severe 
health uh, consequences of the disease. In, and I think if you notice, there was 50% um, or more prevalence of, in pigs. So, and pigs were unable to sell their pigs. Um, so they were seeing, uh, for infected pigs, 45% less um, from pigs. And when a pig's worth about $100, it's, it's quite a lot of money, really. So um, what did we learn? Um, so we, I talked about central point vaccination campaign. It was a very efficient way to, um, to vaccinate pigs. Um, we couldn't do this in Zambia and Nepal. Uh, had to do house to house. The farmers weren't willing to bring their pigs to a central point. So you're going to face obstacles like that. Um, but you could do, uh, by this way, a team can do 70 pigs a day with a central point vaccination campaign. Um, field teams with motorbikes uh, very, um, can carry the pig snares <coughs> and the boards uh, and the ice boxes and, and so on to keep the uh, cold chain. This all was very practical uh, in terms of the, the field trial. Um, I'm going to gloss over that one. So, so, the so the conclusions were that it was extremely safe, um, high level of compliance and highly effective in all four sites. Um, we did a market scoping study. Um, to look at this uh, using willingness to pay um, uh, uh, for vaccine um, and pricing. If they got a premium price for pork, they were willing to pay um, uh, for, for the vaccine and oxfendazole and between $1 and $6 um, uh, per price. Um, there's a yeah, so um, key, key recommendations and obviously, you know, the key needs identified registration, uh, smaller pack sizes for dewormers for the small numbers of pigs that hold, pig holders have, need for capacity building and the One Health approach, uh, and public-private partnerships. We also ran a control, um, sister psychosis control stakeholder workshop in India and Africa, where we brought together key policy, technical, commercial and development stakeholders, shared information on uh, current consistent psychosis control initiatives um, to enhance understanding um, and, and land, uh, presented our landscaping gap analysis and case studies on control, including Madagascar, where they've been using a One Health approach um, to, uh, to control assisted psychosis. And um, uh, as yet, they're not using pig control. They're only doing, focusing at the moment on humans, but they hope to move to, to pig vaccination and, and, ox, uh, and dewormer. So uh, we explored One Health approaches and we gained commitment from policymakers that were present from uh, Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya, um, Madagascar, Zambia and South Africa to, to take action to control cystic psychosis, um, at least verbally anyway. Um, they also formed a group of country champions um, to set up, the, to disseminate information to all the stakeholders that were present, because um, this is one area that's, that's lacking. So challenges for a One Health approach um, in terms of um, engaging policy and technical, commercial uh, and development stakeholders, including funders, is, um, is, 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 a, is a challenge. And um, gaining commitment from, the, from policy model funders and act to actually do something about it. And obviously there's a lack of funds. Um, but the problem really is there's no collective responsibility and coordination between the sectors um, and a lack of an awareness and funds make it very difficult. Here. And it's basically a vicious circle of neglect um, with lack of information leading to lack of commitment and will of, for will and social resources. Um, and there's a need to con establish common objectives. So there's um, registration and availability of vaccination drugs is a challenge, a huge challenge. Um, it can be very slow. Our paranthic in Uganda has been taken three months. Uh, three months, three years to get to a stage where we still don't have a license, but hopefully shortly the, uh, our partner um, will, will have a license there shortly. But um, it is challenging, um, basically because of um, uh, pharmacists, that mainly the assessors are pharmacists who don't understand about vaccines. Um, uh, there's one national authority that I was told that have not registered a vaccine in three years. There are variable requirements, and Andy mentioned this yesterday, between the different countries, uh, and it's not a transparent system. So it can be very frustrating for, um, for private sector multinationals. So moving towards a, a One Health approach, all these sectors need to be involved uh, and op opportunities explored for integrating approaches uh, with other NTD controls, um, like soil transmitted helmets, uh, schistosomiasis control initiative, uh, wash initiatives, obviously, uh, and it also um, could be uh, alongside food safety initiatives and also mental health initiatives also. 
So despite the strong interest in One Health implementation, there remains limited, um, uh, limited uh, uh, action, activity no, limited action, due to the complexities um, of, 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 this, uh, of, of the integration and uh, lack of um, tested operational methods and metrics for evaluating, the tour, uh, the evaluating uh, One Health approaches. So um, with cystic psychosis, um, tool readiness and synergies with other diseases I've mentioned are already there, that are ideal for modelling One Health approaches. Um, and there I must, uh, I think I must finish by acknowledging our partners in, in terms of uh, with the vaccine, um, Indian Immunologicals and uh, University of Melbourne and um, MCI Santi Animal for the uh, Oxfendazole and provided for our field trials and our partners in the field trials um, in Nepal, Hefa, Tanzania with Sokoini University, uh, Copenhagen University, Uganda uh, with the Ministry of Agriculture and Zambia with uh, ITM in Belgium and Ghent University and um, University of Zambia. <coughs> and ob obviously finally to our funders, DFID and uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Cisvax, you mentioned a minimum efficacy requirement of 80%. Do you mean 80% cure rate or do you mean 80% reduction of mean cyst counts? And, and what is this threshold based on? Um, I, I'm not, I'm, I, I confess I'm not 100% sure. Um, it was not a uh, table that I put together. Um, but uh, it, 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 it's basically in terms of um, protection against um, cystocytosis, so, yeah, so presence, prevalence of cysts in the, in the pigs. Edwin, are you not a member of the project? <laughs> Is that not your people who decide that? No, that's Pierre Rooney's group. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just wondering because it's, it's, it's a general issue in vaccine development against helminths and, and probably also in other pathogens on, on how good what level of protection do you need to have a significant effect on, on prevalence or infection intensity in the field? And yeah. uh, for some vaccine candidates, there are mathematical models being developed to, to ask that question or to, to answer that question. But for m many other vaccines, this is just empirical. And I was wondering about, about this one. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's basically a, tar this, it's a target profile. Um, so, Efficacy. What is your ideal, um, uh, ideal? What's the word I'm looking for? Um, indications for use, really. So for some diseases, I guess it, it, reduction. Um, for many diseases, it's it's not possible to prevent. It's difficult to prevent. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so the claims that you have for the vaccine will very much depend on, obviously, the vaccine, but um, but also the disease. Uh, itself um, but even I, I within mean, a disease in, 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 that, in that particular one uh, uh, we are talking about the, the prevention of cysts um, so we want to uh, reduce uh, you know get myself mixed up now but <laughs> preventing cysts in pigs um. okay thank you a um, couple of things um, when you treat with oxfendazole you usually have uh, an impact on other parasites and farmers love that. Um, so th there's potentially quite a lot of confusion about the vaccine and oxfendazole impacts. Um, so I just yes, kind of wonder whether you've managed to sort of sort that out a little bit. Um, <laughs> and, and the willingness to pay issues that you've indicated, um, is that sufficient to actually cover the delivery costs and the, the price of these products? Um, and I suppose the other thing that occurred to me when you were talking, I mean, one of the things I experienced in Bolivia with this kind of approach was getting hold of 25% concentration of oxfendazole is not straightforward. Mm. Um, so did you have any difficulties in, in finding the right concentration of, of oxfendazole? Um, yeah, on, on the first question in terms of um, 
d differentiating the impact of uh, uh, the, the effect, sorry, of uh, oxvendazole and, and, and the vaccine. Um, yes, it is. It is a complicated um, scenario, and uh, and even our uh, vaccine manufacturers uh, quite often, uh, when they were putting their marketing literature together, got themselves confused with um, and, and, and claiming you know improvements in weight gain and so on, and, and clearly a lack of understanding about the disease is. Um, because uh, cystocytosis doesn't cause uh, weight loss in, in pigs, whereas obviously other uh, helmets do. So um, I, I think, um, and, and obviously the you know the anecdotal evidence from Uganda from the farmers saying, oh, we got our pigs were heavier and healthier, and and so on. Undoubtedly, more due to the broad spectrum activity oxfendazole rather than the um, uh, the T solium uh, vac the vaccine. The vaccine. Sorry? The oxfendazole treatment is to get humans rid of the tapeworm and no. it's not on pigs. No, no, the oxfendazole was used in, in, in the pigs. And do they remove the cysts which are already present? Yes, they do, yes. And is there no treatment for humans in that scheme? Yes, of there getting is, yeah, rid yeah. With they, do, they don't right. use, oxfendazole's not used and I haven't been able to establish well, why they don't use oxfendazole. Edwin, um, how, how do they treat the humans to get rid of tena solum? Albendazole can be used. Um, they, more often, praziquantel also is used in niclosamide. But, but, but Edwin, how effective is it to remove the cysts? It is. I have no idea. I, I don't think mm. it is. There are some concerns with using these, uh, these uh, antihelmintics in people with neurocystosicosis because when the cysts are killed, there's an inflammatory reaction around the cysts and that can cause, um, uh, and, and that's one of the areas that people are monitoring, need, need to monitor in, 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 in these sorts of control strategies using mass drug administration. And I have a second question. When you have 17% and it goes to zero, that means that you did not include the 17 percent in your re-evaluation. Because once infected, they stay infected, or not? No, the, the oxfendazole does clear. Uh, they're not the same pig, so that's uh, they obviously. Obviously. So so they're yeah they're, they're coming around. Right. Yeah. But the uh, but treat, deworming them does remove the, uh, it removes the cysts. They they the cysts die. They they can calcify and then they and and then they they sort of. Uh, are barely detectable. I think it takes about 12 weeks for that to occur. Um, so, uh, so as I mentioned in the Tanzania study, um, the oxfendazole only ones had had some cysts, but they were degenerated cysts. Um, yeah. um, so I think there's some more questions I've got. To, oh, I had to answer there. Um, so, uh, could, can you remind me what the other question was? Oh, the form, yes, yeah. Well, we specifically identified a manufacturer who could manufacture, um, uh, I'm going to try and remember what the 10%. So 10% paranthic is, uh, sorry, paranthic is 10% um, oxfendazole, which is, yes, a quite high um, compared to other uh, uh, animal uh, oxfendazole preparations. And it is very difficult to manufacture um, uh, and quite expensive to manufacture as well. But this um, originally, the original studies with um, oxfendazole and, and cystosicosis um, used um, Miriel's product, which I think is 9%. They have a 9% formulation. But I suspect 10% is about as high as you can go. Um, and then the dose rate is quite high compared to um, for, for, you, for what you would use with other um, worms, other um, helminths. So I think it's something like six times higher than... Um, uh, I thought the Peruvian was used 25% because of the issue of having too much volume. Yeah, I can't. I don't. I don't. I don't remember what uh, what that paper said. But if, yeah, but uh, all all the work that we've done with Oxfendazole, Gal, with with our partners, um, was using 10% paranthic at 30 milligrams per mil. Um, and the published the, the published papers on it um, use that dose. Uh, and had similar levels of efficacy to the vaccine in, in the sort of greater than 95%. So, um, so it was h certainly highly effect effective at that dose rate. Was there another question? I can't. No. I'm 
Angie. Um, well done for a very interesting paper. Um, on the question of the human application of uh, oxfendazole, and I'm, I'm a few years out of date on this, but I'm pretty sure that there was a, a US initiative to get oxfendazole licensed for, for human application, I guess through USAID or something, but I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the details, so whether that's happened by now, I'm not too sure. But I had a question about... Um, about um, er eradication, or probably more correctly, elimination. Uh, this was on a list of diseases in the 1990s for potential eradication, you said. Do you, do you think that is any closer to being uh, a reality? Or, uh, uh, and has this vaccine, or does this vaccine potentially make a contribution to that? I'm, I'm thinking probably more realistically about elimination from a, an area or a country rather than uh, eradication. Uh, and a second question, you talked about sustainability in one of your last slides and we touched on things like that yesterday, talking about public versus private good. And clearly this is largely a, a public good because it doesn't seem to have much benefit as far as the pig's concerned. And one of the things we talked about some years ago was to try to develop a bi bivalent vaccine or multivalent vaccine that that incorporated some antigens from uh, significant swine disease. For example, CSF, I think, was one thing that was talked about. I wondered if any, any of those things had been progressed, really. Um, can you repeat the first question? <laughs> um, it was just to mention about the human application of oxfendazole, but then yeah. to ask whether you think now, 20 years on from the listing of neurocystis psychosis as being a potentially eradicable disease, that, that has moved on in any way? Yeah, yeah no, I think we have moved on um, uh, quite a bit. Um, uh, bearing in mind the, the lack of um, funding, and, and, and uh, but uh, a, a lot of the research groups work very closely together. And when I went to the Systernet meeting, I was really um, impressed by the way the groups work together and, um, and share results, uh, share tools. Uh, uh, reagents and it, it's, it's, it's quite nice to see in a, in a field I think um, that, uh, that people do uh, work well together and I, I found that that particular organization that uh, um, funding project was was a, was very productive um, unfortunately the European funding has just completed and so um, uh, we are at a little bit of a there is a bit a, a big gap in terms of um, the funding to keep these um, things going um, I, I, ourselves galvmed um, our funding in for, for the poor scientist psychosis um, project has finished and, and I think we, we got to where we were intending to get to but um, there's now going to be a bit of a vacuum and we're obviously still supporting the registration activities of the but there is so much more to do in terms of sensitization and, and uh, bringing the, the, the sectors together and to get the collaborative approaches and uh, you know it's where the, where the funding will come from um, but, uh, but that's what I'm working on at the moment um, but I think we're still on, the, on, the, on that road map as I mentioned earlier I think we're still on that road map and we're still looking towards 2020 for having um, larger scale um, uh, uh, field interventions going on um, and I think we still, we do still, one of the things we do have to do is establish what that roadmap is and then, uh, and the stages like the, like the rabies blueprint that I showed up. Um, in terms of your other question, um, which, sorry, just repeat it again, I'll, I will answer it. Multivalent vaccine? Yes, multivalent vaccine. Yes, um, I did mention that in the ideal vaccine uh, pro target product profile, um, combinations with things like classical swine fever and African swine fever um, would be, and, and certainly in India, our partners in India are developing uh, a combination classical swine fever um, uh, T sol vaccine uh, and plus, plus or minus foot and mouth disease as well. So, um, and obviously, we are working on a project um, with uh, we have a, a discovery project with um, uh, Perbright on a potential African swine fever. Um, project we have funding for that so um, but that's a bit of a way off before we can potentially put that with um, with the T-Sol vaccine okay thank you <laughs> Brian did you want to say something did you want to say something Brian <laughs> Yeah, my
mine was just a quick one. It's just um, regarding, uh, you was, it was with the centralised, talking about centralised vaccination points, and then that, comparing that with you, like some of your, um, uh, I don't know what you called, but you were either going house to house or having a centralised vaccination point. And you were saying that it'd be preferable, I believe, to uh, have the, to use a centralised vaccination point. Um, but I would argue, or maybe I, I kind of want to pose the question, if having a centralised vaccination point, you're, um, you then risk bringing animals, to, animals together that wouldn't have otherwise been in contact, and therefore yeah. you have the same um, situation as you do in markets where you then, if anything, risk spreading disease. And I guess secondary to that, um, what, am I right in thinking the group where you had, you was, um, as you're saying, they were ravaged with um, African swine fever and you had that problem. Was that the group where you, where you were using the centralised vaccine? It was a different group, okay. No. But yeah, no, I guess that was my question would yeah. be having, bringing, all, having, bringing all the animals together from different areas and vaccinating them sorry, in one place, would you then not risk? Yeah, yes, that, it, obviously that is, that is a huge be. risk with, um, with livestock and bringing them all together. But they, I mean, the, these, these pigs are actually roaming all over the place um, anyway so and, and and when it's a central vaccination but they're not coming from long distances it's really basically having you know within a mile uh, or two miles sort of, and then bringing but all pigs within that area so um, and, and in Zambia the, the uh, and Nepal actually the village the, the the huts were really the villages were very close together and you literally in Zambia particularly you could walk um, you could take you an hour to walk through the all the three villages that we were that we were working and, to, and so I want to add to that, you, you have a lot of viruses that are causing varemia. Mm. Even in, uh, 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 with good practices in, in, for instance in, in Europe, you see sometimes outbreaks due to the fact that you do serial injections. So uh, you, had, you, com you were confronted yourself with a lot of problems. Yes. So I think there is a huge biosafety issue in countries like Africa. I think, uh, I think there should be a lot of efforts and also the the mass of energy and, and labor behind that. I think people should really think in the direction of oral vaccination mm. and try to get, to get that thing sec settled. So well, then you, you don't have a lot of problems with the biosafety, mm. you're out of that. And then I think it will become more easy than just doing serial injections because I think this, this will have a lot of problems at the level of biosafety. I yeah, think so. Yeah. I think one of the thing, items in the uh, target product profile was to have needleless injection technology and um, things like that. <laughs> um, also in, in the trial I didn't mention but we, we did um, have uh, very strong biosafety measures in terms of um, using obviously separate syringes between pigs and needles and uh, disinfecting between um, households um, so they, they all are investigated. Like yeah. but, but going from house to house uh, in terms of you know the you know your, your number of pigs you can do doing that can go down you know, to very drastically down to like seven. I, I mentioned 70 in, in Uganda with a central vaccine. You can you go down to about 10 um, yeah, or less in, in, in places like Nepal and Zambia. Um, sometimes the pigs run away and they're really difficult to catch unless you prime the farmers to tether them and keep keep them tethered till you get there. But so, but it, all that all that coordination is is very. The logistics are quite tricky. Um, and I, I forgot to mention because someone asked uh, about costs of the vaccination um, and in terms of the in Uganda where we had the central vaccination I did do a, a sort of costing of how much it cost the teams and so on and the, uh, even the motorbikes and the petrol and uh, and all that sort of thing and, and it came to about five dollars per pig um, so you know I think which is still I think is still is, is a doable thing I think if you if we looked at the costings in Zambia and Nepal um, but yeah, the costings would be quite a bit higher. Um, and that's based on a field team of two people. Um, and that would be the minimum that you could really get away with. Target protocol profile, you want to head to potentially single vaccination and then multiple vaccination was uh, raised as an issue um, just earlier. Uh, so you were saying you're searching for new funding for, for rollout sensitization. What's the strategy for developing a vaccine that needs much fewer um, immunizations or even the oral vaccination strategy? What, is, are, you, are you trying to source funding for that or what, what, what yeah what I think is some that? of those uh, yeah uh, well no no we're not uh, for sing we're not sourcing for single vaccination um, uh, specifically um, 
Because obviously we've developed Cisvax, um, so it would be a completely new vaccine. Um, there are, I know there are other um, projects on the go, uh, potentially looking at single vaccine technology um, using T Sol 18. But um, yes, it's certainly a way forward. Uh, what I didn't mention, one of the, the challenges with um, vaccinating pigs, and particularly if you're giving them two vaccinations, is when you go to, uh, normally pigs are not identified, they have no tags or anything. And knowing which pigs have had how many vaccinations is, you know, is really, is difficult. The farmers won't remember, uh, you know. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, and then also, so you, you give a pig a vaccination and then you say, you, you know, we must keep it. We're coming back in three months time. We'll, you know, we'll vaccinate it again. Um, you know, things happen and then the farmer says, needs to sell his pig and, and, the, and the pigs disappear. So, uh, or, you know, it's, it's, it's really a very fluid um, um, situation on the ground. Um, so, so we, I mean, we, we actually, um, obviously I did identify our pigs, every pigs, and we had a um, numbering system so that we knew how many vaccinations they had, just so that we could collect the information, have the best, and we've got all that data, of how many each of the necropsy pigs, how many vaccinations they had, and you know, whether they had one, two, three, or four. Um, so we've got all that to, um, that we're still analyzing, and as well as all the caps um, um, stuff as well. So we're, we're, we'll be publishing that in the next, uh, in the next six months or so.